Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Rabbi Danny Schiff. For those of you who uh, don't know me, I hold the position of being the foundation scholar at the Jewish Federation, and uh, I'm very grateful that you have uh, joined us for this uh, midnight session of uh, Tikkun Leil Online. Let me immediately, in advance of uh, later tonight, uh, wish all of you Hag Sameach. Uh, though clearly the Sameach part is going to be difficult, frankly, for uh, for the Jewish people uh, at this particular time. Uh, we're, we're all painfully aware uh, of what is going on in Israel. Those of you who are who do, who do not know, I'm, I'm actually in Jerusalem where it's 7 a.m. in the morning after a a night of, uh, of rocket fire over much of uh, central and uh, and southern Israel. And uh, it is plain that Shavuot is going to be Shavuot at war for Israel this year, which is a painful and, uh, uh, and disturbing reality. Nevertheless, as you are all aware, it is our duty when festivals come along to the Samachta Bechagecha, to rejoice in our festivals to the extent that that is possible. So mindful of the tensions and the difficulty and the pain being experienced all over this area, uh, we nevertheless will celebrate Zman Matan Torah Tenu, the time of the giving of Torah. And the subject that I, I want to address for the next uh, 50 minutes, we, we will wrap up this morning at 12.50 uh, a.m. The subject I want to address is the subject of Rahav. Rahav, a woman that many do not know from within the context of the Tanakh or do not know well enough. And let, let's focus for a moment on, on what Tikkun Leil is really all about. Tikkun Leil that we're doing here online 24 hours early, but obviously is supposed to be part of the study routine that we will all uh, be given the opportunity to perform uh, tonight uh, as part of Shavuot. Uh, Tikkun Leil is really about studying Torah. Torah in the broadest sense, not Torah simply in terms of the first five books of the of the Bible, but rather Torah as we perceive it, uh, the written Torah, the oral Torah, more generally. And what we we often don't pay much attention to is what what happens after the written Torah comes to an end. We are used to Simchat Torah concluding the words of Deuteronomy and then immediately rolling back to the start of uh, of Genesis and uh, beginning all over with the words of creation. But what happens? Once Moses dies at the conclusion of Deuteronomy with the Jewish people on the edge of the land of Israel, about to go over into the land of Israel, what exactly happens once Moses is no more and the unfolding saga of the Jewish people continues? So what I'm really interested in is those opening couple of chapters of the book of Joshua, which immediately follows the Torah, the conclusion of the written Torah in the Tanakh, how that unfolds. And I could not have known when I set this particular subject matter for our study tonight, I could not possibly have known that Israel would be at war over the existence of the Jewish people in this region, as every war that Israel fights uh, has been. But in reality, the opening chapters of the book of Joshua are all about conquest. They're all about the very first war that the Jewish people fights to take the land. And so I want to situate the experience of Rahab and what she means as a woman and as a or Hev Yisrael, one who ultimately comes to love the Jewish people. I want to situate her experience within the context of that very first conquest of the land of Israel 
undertaken by our people. Uh, to the, in in, in this, the session this evening, I, I do not intend to in, to uh, engage you in much discussion, uh, and, and, but I, I do encourage you to, to stop me if you have questions at, uh, at any juncture. This is uh, uh, certainly a, uh, uh, I certainly want to want to make sure that I, I respond to, to questions that, uh, uh, that arise for you, and I will not be leaving time for questions at the end. So if something occurs to you during my presentation, don't write it in the chat because I'm not reading the chat while I'm while I'm teaching. But uh, but please, uh, you're you're welcome at any moment to uh, uh, to put your electronic hand up or simply come off mute and uh, and to ask a question. And because this night is really all about uh, text study, I will be sharing the sharing the screen for uh, the rest of the duration because uh, we need to uh, uh, to examine a few texts. So to begin with. Let's explore the morality of the conquest of the land within which these opening chapters of the book of Joshua are set. You'll remember that the very first words that God speaks to Abraham, the first Jew, those, those initial words that God speaks to Abraham are, go to the land that I will show you the promise of the land itself. And when Abraham first comes to the land, what does he discover? The land is not empty. There are people here. There are people who dwell in the land. There has never been a point in the history of the Jewish people when the Jewish people has been in the land or come to the land where there have not been other people in the land. And that's true, of course, as well, after the period of slavery in Egypt, when we wander through the desert for 40 years so that the generation that knew slavery would die off. And then we come into the land after Moses dies, when Joshua takes over the leadership, we come into the land. The land has inhabitants. There are seven Canaanite nations in the land. But when I use the word nation here, don't imagine nations as in the contemporary usage of that terminology. Rather, these are more or less extended towns, rather large tribes. And the Jewish people is enjoined to put the Canaanite nations to the sword. We're told to do that in the book of Deuteronomy. Why? Because this is going to be a war, a war unlike any other war fought in history up until that juncture, a war over the nature of ideas that would become enshrined in this very place, which would be the springboard for the Jewish nation. What does that mean, a war over ideas? Every war that was fought in the ancient world had none of the discussions of the morality and the ethics of war that we focus on, that we talk about extensively today. War in the ancient world was a very simple matter. You went to war in order to increase your possessions, land holdings, cattle, agriculture. Might was right. You went to war in order to take other people's property, to enslave them, or to enlarge your territory, enlarge your holdings, make your Self more prosperous. There was no there was no sophisticated ethics around war. But here the Jewish people come along, enjoined by the written Torah to take the land, not for purposes of enriching themselves or enlarging their territory, but rather for purposes of trying to enshrine a different vision of reality for the world, a reality which would be based on the one God for all of humanity rather than the idolatry and the polytheism that prevailed. So the war that the Jewish people was going to embark upon here was not a war that was primarily about we want slaves and we want possessions, we want to take your land, rather it was we need 
this particular small slither of land in order to begin to create a society that will be based on a fundamentally different perception, a fundamentally different perception of reality, a perception of reality based on the one God that would be the God for all humanity. And let's take a look here at the text from Deuteronomy that instructs how the Jewish people should conduct themselves upon entering upon upon entering into the land of Israel and encountering the Canaanite nations. Deuteronomy 20. When you draw near to a city to wage war against it, then you shall first proclaim peace. Let's not rush past that verse. When you wage war against a city, you shall first proclaim peace. In other words, you don't get to go to war unless you have offered the people in that city peace, the possibility of peace first. That's a radical idea in the ancient world. In some places, it's a radical idea in the modern world. If they respond in kind and open the gates for you, then all of the people that are in the city will pay tribute and serve you. If they do not surrender peacefully, but rather fight against you, then you shall besiege them. When God gives the city into your hands, then you shall smite all of its men by the sword. But the women, the children, the animals, and all of the goods that are in the city you may take, for so shall you consume the spoils of your enemy that God your Lord gives you. Thus shall you do to all of the cities that are very far away from you, that are not the cities of, those na of these nations here, but from the cities of these people that God your Lord gives you as an inheritance, you shall not spare any soul. Rather, you shall completely destroy them. The Hittite, the Amorite, Amorite the Canaanite, the Prezite, the Chibite, the, Ye the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God commands you. This is in order that they not teach you to perform all of the abominations that they do in the service of their gods, for then you shall transgress against God your Lord. It's a painful passage. The passage that says, when you encounter the seven Canaanite nations, you shall utterly destroy them. And the rabbis in the oral Torah explain why. Because the Canaanite nations are essentially the way that we would perceive Al-Qaeda. They are the inverse of civilization. They are murderers. They are rapists. They are the worst of the worst. It's either you or them. So the Torah has a very strong position, at least at the literal level, of how you should deal with the Canaanite nations. But the rabbis said that the Torah shouldn't be read literally in this regard. Look at Nachmanides, the Ramban, his commentary on this passage. Indeed, the passage from Deuteronomy distinguishes between both types of enemy, but only insofar as combat is concerned. The injunction to extend an offer of peace, however, applies even to obligatory wars, such as those waged against the seven nations of Canaan. Of Canaan. After all, didn't Moshe, Moses, send a communique of peace to Sichon, the king of the Amorites? Emir Surely Moses would not have abrogated the commandments enjoined by this passage of destroy them utterly and spare not a soul. Rather, there's a, there is a difference between the Canaanites and the non-Canaanites only when the terms of surrender are refused and battle is joined. In that case, the women and children of far off cities are to be spared while those of Canaan are to be killed. What is Nachmanides saying? What Nachmanides is saying is, even with the Canaanite nations, these people who represent the inverse of civilization, these people who are going to make it so difficult, so problematic for you to establish a civilization based on godliness and the pursuit of fine, upright human conduct, even there with the Canaanite nations, your duty first and foremost is offer them peace. contrary to the practice of the entire ancient world, offer them peace terms. And if they agree, if they agree to, to the peace terms that are offered, then under those circumstances, you're not to touch them. You will live alongside them. 
Notice the philosophy here. The land was never empty. The Jewish people wasn't designed to come and live in the land by ourselves. Where there were inhabitants of the land who were prepared to make peace with us, we were going to offer them peace terms and live side by side with the possibility of establishing our own national vision. And so with that particular context in mind, we go to the book of Joshua in order to discover Rahav, this extraordinary woman who really exemplifies so much of what we would hope to find in the other as we enter the land of Israel. The book of Joshua, chapter 2. By the way, this particular section is the Haftarah for the Torah portion Shlach Lecha, which we will be encountering two weeks from now. Shlach Lecha, as many of you are aware, is that portion where Moses dispatches the spies to go spy out the land. And not surprisingly, the reason that this particular chapter of Joshua is the Haftarah for Shlach Lecha is because Joshua before they go into actually make war against the Canaanites, Joshua dispatches spies as well to see what the condition of the land will be like. In the first chapter of the book of Joshua, right after the Torah comes to an end, God says to the Jewish people, Hazak ve'ematz, be strong and resolute, go forward now, younger generation. Go in and take the land, cross the Jordan. The time has come. But before that moment arrives, Joshua is going to dispatch spies to see what are the conditions? How will we actually go about now taking the land? And here's what happens in chapter 2. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, saying, Go, reconnoiter the region of Jericho. So they set out and they came to the house of a harlot named Rachel. She's a prostitute and lodged there. The king of Jericho was told, some men have come here tonight, Israelites, to spy out the country. The king of Jericho thereupon sent orders to Rachel, produce the men who came to you and entered your house, for they have come to spy out the whole country. The woman, however, had taken the two men and hidden them. It's true, she said. The men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. And at dark, when the gate was about to be closed, the men left. I don't know where the men went. Quick, go after them, or you can overtake them. The king of Jericho, the ruler of her town, of her grouping, says to her, produce the men. And she, like Shifra and Pua before her, shield these Jewish men and throw the authorities off the scent, off the track. Verse 6, now she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under some stalks of flax which she had lying on the roof. So the men pursued them in the direction of the Jordan down to the fords, and no sooner had the pursuers gone, gone out than the gate was shut behind them. The spies had not yet gone to sleep, when she came up to them on the roof. And these three verses are going to be pivotal for us. So pay attention to the wording here. She said, she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given the country to you. The Lord, as in the God that is the only God, the only possible God, the Lord with a capital Lord has given the country to you because dread of you has fallen upon us and all the inhabitants of, of, the, of the land are quaking before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the sea of reeds for you when you left Egypt. Notice, by the way, not the Red Sea, but the Sea of Reeds when you left Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og and two Amorite kings across the Jordan whom you doomed. When we heard about it, we lost heart 
and no man had any more spirit left because of you. For the Lord your God is the only God in heaven above and on earth below. Contemplate for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, what those three verses represent in terms of the insight of Rahav, the prostitute. Rahav wasn't taught this by anybody. Rahav didn't get to hear great speeches by her leaders instructing her in this particular series of insights. Rahav is a student of history. Rahav has come to understand on her own the reality that God is the God of history and that God has stepped into history in order to propel the Jewish people, this group of ex-slaves, towards their destiny in the land. And she has perceived what that means for the future. We'll come back to these verses. Verse 12. Now, since I have shown loyalty, use, loyalty to you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will show loyalty to my family, provide me with a reliable sign that you will spare the lives of my mother, my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and save us from death. The men answered her, our persons are pledged for yours even to death. If you do not disclose this mission of ours, we will show you true loyalty when the Lord gives us the land. She let them down by a rope through the window. For her dwelling was at the outer side of the city wall, and she lived in the actual wall. She said to them, make for the hills so that the pursuers may not come upon you. Stay there in hiding three days until the pursuers return, then go your way. But men warned her. We will be released from this oath, which you have made us take, unless when we invade the country, you tie this length of crimson cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your family together in your house. And if anyone ventures outside the doors of your house, his blood will be on his head and we shall be clear. But if a hand is laid on anyone who remains in the house with you, his blood shall be on our heads. Now notice, by the way, the crimson cord. The crimson cord, which will play a role even in our own generation. I'll speak about that in a little while. But the crimson cord, this red sign that will mark the house is an obvious and deliberate echo of Yitziat Mitzrayim, of the Exodus from Egypt, just as the Israelites would daub with blood the doorposts of their house to mark which particular house should be saved in the Exodus. So the instruction here is take something red, the cord in this case, to mark this house as the one that should be saved. Why is it the one should, that should be saved? Because of the righteousness of Rachel. A few more verses from chapter 2, and then we'll find out what actually happens in chapter 7. And if you disclose this mission of ours, we shall likewise be released from the oath which you made us take. She replied, let it be as you say. She sent them on their way, and they left, and she tied the crimson cord to the window. They went straight to the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers turned back. And so the pursuers searching all along the road did not find them. These spies were saved by Rahab. Then the two men came down again from the hills and crossed over. They came to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported to him all that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has delivered the land into our power. In fact, all the inhabitants of the land are quaking before us. From Rahab, they get the insight of what the spy, of what the people of the land are actually thinking. From Rachav, they get to live and tell the story to Joshua of what possibility lies ahead. A few chapters later, the Jewish people have entered the land and they're marching around Jericho. You know this particular section well, but here's what happens to Rachav, chapter 7. On the seventh day, they rose at, do at daybreak, the Jewish people, and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. That was the only day that they marched around the city seven times. 
On the seventh round, as the priests blew the horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and everything in it are to be proscribed for the Lord. Only Rachav the harlot is to be spared, and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers we sent. But you must beware of that which is proscribed, or else you will be proscribed. If you take anything from that which is proscribed, you will cause the camp of Israel to be proscribed. proscribed. You will bring calamity upon it. All the silver and gold objects of copper and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They must go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the horns were sounded. When the people heard the sound of the horns, the people raised a mighty shout and the wall collapsed. The people rushed into the city, every man straight in front of him, and they captured the city. They exterminated everything in the city with the sword, man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass. But Joshua obeyed the two men who had spied out the land. Go into the harlot's house and bring out the woman and all that belongs to her as you swore to her. So the young spies went in and brought out Rachav, her father and her mother, her brothers and all that belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and left them outside the camp of Israel. They burned down the city and everything in it. But the silver and gold and the objects of copper and iron were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord. Only Rachel of the Halot and her father's family were spared by Joshua, along with all that belonged to her. And she dwelt among the Israelites, as is still the case. For she had hidden the messengers, messengers that Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, what do we have here? What we have here is a very ugly description of the conquest of Jericho. The Jewish people, the Tanakh tells us directly, exterminate everybody. Kill every man, woman, and child. Exactly as instructed in the book of Deuteronomy. Except, of course, for one family. The family of this righteous Gentile, because that's the only way you can describe her, this righteous Gentile, Rachav, who has had this insight that the Jewish people mean something tremendously significant in history, and who saved the lives of the spies when the king's men were pursuing after them, and who essentially opened the door for the Jewish people to come into the land of Israel. Rachav is a prostitute. A prostitute, as you know, is not exactly a favored profession in Jewish history. A woman whose sexual conduct puts her into the category of transgression. A woman who lives on the edge of society not only in terms of what she does, but physically she lives at the edge of the town. How extraordinary. The Jewish people that lives at the edge and on the edge of humanity will be saved here when the door to Jericho, the door to the land of Israel is opened by a woman who lives on the edge. A commentary by a contemporary rabbi, contemporary rabbi uh, who has visited Pittsburgh a number of times, Rabbi Jeffrey Salkin, in his extraordinary book, which I recommend to you, Righteous Gentiles in the Hebrew Bible, a commentary, contemporary commentary on Rahav. And what Rachav means for the broader history of the Jewish people. Just want to follow the highlighted sections here and make some comments about what Rabbi Salkin writes. There is, writes Rabbi Salkin, sadly, no real way around the truth that Rachav was a prostitute. Even modern Hebrew slang admits this because it refers to prostitutes as being Nibet Rachav. 
in contemporary Hebrew, from the house of Rachel. The Talmud says that Rachel began her career at the age of 10. And by the way, continued to be a prostitute for 40 years, from the age of 10 to the age of 50. Is there no trace of sadness in these ancient words? A prostitute since the age of 10? Are we not allowed at the very least a gasp of horror? Apparently not. The rabbis say that Rachav had an international clientele that amounted to a list of every ancient king and prince in the world. The rabbis say that along with Sarah, Abigail, and Esther, Rachav was one of the four most beautiful women in history. They said that if a man was experiencing impotence, just saying, Rachav, Rachav, would solve the problem. Forget Viagra. They should have called it Racha. This was no ordinary woman. In fact, the Hebrew Bible that describes the presence of the spies in her house is itself a double entendre. The text says they lodged there. Vayishkavu shama. But it's an interesting choice of terminology because the usual term for lodge is lalun. But no, these men did more than lodge there. They lay down, vayishkavu there, which is a good biblical euphemism for the sexual act. What really happened that night? The spies stayed at Beit Rachav. We don't know. What's important to us is she saved them. But the text hints that they lay down at Beit Rachav. Moreover, writes Rabbi Sorkin, let's remember where she lives. In a house, on the edge of town, on the edge of the land of Israel, Jericho is the very first town that you encounter when you come across the eastern border of the land of Israel, which is the direction the Jews were coming from. As a prostitute, she lives on the edge of society. Paradox of paradoxes. The redemption of the Jewish people, the quintessential outsider people, comes through the agency of the quintessential outsider woman. It's a wonderful literary device. Where have we seen the deception that Rachav exhibits before Shifra and Pua fail to murder the Hebrew infants? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. Exodus tells us before the midwife can come to them, they have given birth. In the words of the late biblical scholar Tivka, Tiv, Tikva Primakensky, Rachav is proactive, smart, tricky and unafraid to disobey and deceive the king. Not just a righteous Gentile, but a woman who takes her own life in her hands to defy the authorities, to tell them, to give them information that will throw them off the track, and to hide at risk of her own life those who are coming into the land. Jump down to the bottom of the, uh, the next paragraph. Rachav asks that her family's life be spared. It's a reasonable request. But as we saw in the text of Deuteronomy where we started, where Deuteronomy tells us that we're to put away, to exterminate every single last person from the Canaanite nations, it would be nothing short of the outrageous for the spies to agree to it. Their agreement would mean a violation of the laws of Deuteronomy, which condemn the Canaanites to utter destruction. Yet they do agree. Perhaps this story serves as a countertext to Deuteronomy, as a way of saying there's another way to conquer and ultimately own this land of Israel. And here, ladies and gentlemen, I want to stress the importance of what Rabbi Salkin writes in terms of being in these days in which we find ourselves as we approach Shavuot at war and we open the Torah and in the Torah we see when you make war in the land of Israel exterminate utterly those who will not make peace with you and Rabbi Salkin points out what ought to be clear 
When the Jewish people go into the land of Israel with the Torah in hand, they don't fulfill the words of the Torah. Rachav is allowed to stay alive. Oh, you might say, well, she's clearly an exception. Obviously, they would save Rachav because she saved the spies. She's righteous. So obviously, she would be in the correct category. But the Torah never has a category for the righteous people who might help you. The Torah says, every last can, right? Kill them all. And if you are of the mindset, well, but... Obviously, the Jewish people didn't have to obey that to the letter because Rachav was so good to them. What about Rachav's family? Nobody says that Rachav's family were that they were righteous. They were part of her family. In saving Rachav, together with her family, the Jewish people essentially disregard the plain surface reading of Deuteronomy. They already have moved into a mode where they are prepared to say, you know what? When we make war in the land of Israel, it must be on the broader principles of the mission that we have been sent to fulfill. A mission in which righteous conduct will be what counts. And therefore, when we see righteous conduct, even among Canaanites, when we see members of a broader family who are prepared to support somebody who behaves righteously, we can live alongside people like that in the land. The question is not to what ethnic group do you belong. The question is not from which nation do you emerge. The question is, what is the nature of your conduct? Rahab is the proof. Rahab and her family are treated as exceptions to the clear instruction that Deuteronomy gives to the Jewish people. Rabbi Sulkin writes, the parallel of Rachav's story with that of Exodus, with that of the Exodus from Egypt is stunning. In the Exodus, it was the red blood on the doorposts of the Israelites that warded off the angel of death. Here, Rachav's red thread warded off the human forces of death. It's probably the origin of the red thread that some Kabbalah devotees, famous non-Jews among them, wear around their wrists. You wonder where did the red thread come from in history? It's Rachav's red thread. That red thread which would say, here is a home of righteousness. Here is a place. Here is an individual worthy of protection. But perhaps most importantly of all, and Rabbi Sokin encapsulates this extremely well, those three verses that I pointed out to you, Rachav's insight into the God of Israel and the nature of the history that was unfolding before her. Before her. Here's what Rabbi Salkin writes. The Lord has given you the land. Quoting the second chapter of Joshua. Rachav comes to her understanding of God not through the experience of nature, or through meditation on the meaning of the universe, she comes to God through her sense of God's presence in Jewish history. She bears witness. She, a non-Jew, bears witness to that history. Rahab is, in a way, the first Gentile Zionist, or at least she's the first person in the Bible to discern God's role in Jewish history. She's the first Gentile Zionist. What's a Zionist? It's become a, a term, an epithet, sadly, outside of Israel. A Zionist is a person who believes that the Jewish people finds its national home in the land of Israel. Period. 
And Rachav is the first one, the first non-Jew in history to look at history. By the way, we take history for granted, but she is one of the very first people to say the way history unfolds and the way God moves in history makes God the God of history, and therefore progress becomes possible only when we understand God's intent within history, and she perceives God's intent as allowing the Jewish people to live in the land alongside her and others who would be welcoming the Jewish people to the land, to live in the land of Israel, using the land of Israel as a springboard for demonstrating how a righteous society based on one God for all humanity could potentially be built. She's the first Gentile Zionist in supporting the project of the Jewish people to build a nation in the land that God would promise would have such potential for the Jewish people to have a vision of righteousness that a nation could possibly aspire to reach. Generations later, Rabbi Sorkin writes, the editors of the Jewish prayer book, and I wonder if you discerned this in those three verses from chapter two. Generations, the editors of the Jewish prayer, prayer book will choose her words of faith. The Lord your God is the only God. Rachav says, Rachav's words, in heaven above and on earth below, for a most prominent place in the liturgy at the core of Aleinu. Many of you recognize those words. Part of Aleinu. Aleinu, ladies and gentlemen. That, that prayer at the end of every service, that prayer which in so many ways is the, is the encapsulation. You know, the, the commentary on Aleinu says, if you prayed nothing else with sincerity, then wake up for Aleinu and pray that with sincerity, and that will make up for all your lack of attention earlier in the service. Pray Aleinu with sincerity, and Aleinu is a composite from many different sources, but one of the sentences most profound about God in Aleinu are the words of a non-Jewish prostitute from Jericho called Rachav, who we continue to cite in every single tefillah as having had this wondrous insight about the nature of God and God's particular linkage to the destiny of the Jewish project. The core of the Elenu prayer to conclude every Jewish worship service and express hope for the ultimate coming of God's kingdom. In fact, say the rabbis, Rachav's acceptance of God was superior to that, that of Yitro and Ne'eman, Naaman. For she said publicly that God was the only God in heaven and earth. She didn't have the same privilege that we had of being there at Sinai, of receiving the Torah, of standing in God's presence. She wasn't there like we all were. She was in Jericho, growing up and doing her business in Jericho. And yet, because of what she heard, she came to the conclusion on her own, an insight that puts her on the same level as some of the, the greatest People, the greatest visionaries of Jewish history, she comes to the insight about God by herself without the benefit that we, the Jewish people, had of all the information, all the drumming into our heads of Torah and where Torah comes from that we got. She had none of that. Rachav may have started her life as a prostitute, but her real talents were as a preacher and a theologian. She is the first woman in history to proclaim the will of God as expressed through Jewish history. So what happens with Rafa? And why is she so suitably tied in, my claim, to Shavuot? Perhaps it was because she too lived on the edge of society 
that she was able to find common cause with those whose descendants would perpetually live on the edge of the society. Perhaps she knew that only by possessing the land of Israel could the Israelites break through that sense of marginality. Perhaps she already knew that the role of Zionism was to create a home for the Jewish people wherein they might find a, nominal, a, a normal existence and to create a normal history. What finally happens to Rachel? The Talmud says that she officially joined the Jewish people. Wow! Not only does she have this insight about God on her own, but then she decides to become a Ger Tzedek. Ruth stepped to one side for a minute. There's another righteous convert from the Tanakh, another person who decides, seeing the Jewish odyssey through history, that she will throw her lot in with the Jewish people. Not only does she join the Jewish people, she marries Joshua. Who is Mrs. Joshua? Rabbi Selas Racha. Why not? Joshua's great military leader, he needed a true visionary by his side. And she became the ancestors, according to the Talmud, of eight prophets and priests, among whom were the prophet Jeremiah and the prophetess Fulda. Racha, her name, by the way, literally means broad in, he in Hebrew, and that play on words um, that uh, works for broad in English works in Hebrew as well. Rachav, Rabbi Sulkin wants to, re to really underscore the point here, broadened the story for us. She made the story bigger. And in so doing, she helps us find a place for ourselves in the story as well. And one more step. One more point about Rachav. From the Talmud. After having engaged in prostitution for 40 years, Rachav converted at the age of 50. She said, Master of the universe, I have sinned with three things, with my eye, my thigh, and my stomach. By the merit of three things, pardon me. The rope that she let the spies down with, the window and the wall. Pardon me for engaging the harlotry because I endangered myself when I lowered the rope for the spies from the window in the wall. Another tradition has her saying, pardon me by merit of the rope, the window, and the flax, the stalks of flax under which she concealed the spies. What is this, ladies and gentlemen? This is teshuva. Rachav steps away from prostitution, according to the Talmud. Before she marries Joshua, she does teshuva for her transgressions in the past. Can you wipe away the transgressions of 40 years of prostitution? Of course you can. Not only can you wipe away the transgression of 40 years of prostitution, but look at the final text here. The rabbis deduced from the story of Rachav the superiority of repentance over prayer. Which is greater, teshuva or tefillah? Repentance or prayer? For Moses prayed exceedingly, but God did not accept his, his entreaties to enter the land of Israel. Right? Moses prays and prays. Let me enter the land of Israel. But no, Moses dies when the Torah comes to a conclusion and doesn't get to enter the land. While the repentance of Rachel of the harlot was accepted. And according to the Talmud, kings and prophets issued forth from her. From Rachav, not only do we learn the vision of God and the destiny of the Jewish people to live in the land, we also learn about the power of repentance and that no matter how bad your transgression might be, teshuva is possible. And the teshuva is greater than prayer. We learned it from the example of Rachav this righteous woman of Jewish history who threw her lot in with the Jewish people and without whom the Jewish future in the land might never have come to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a Tag Sameach 
May the Jewish people know peace in the land and around the world. Can you hear us? Good night. And to you, Rabbi, a wonderful you, presentation. Hope all is well and you're safe. Stay safe.